Hey, welcome to Fire Engineering's Hump Day Hangout and to our show, Issues and Challenges in Today's Fire Service. We've got another great show lined up for you today. I'm Chief Rick Lasky, along with my good friend and Hump Day Hangout co-host, Louisville, as I call him, Elroy Jetson, smartest dude I know, Assistant Chief Terry McGrath. And we're joined by the rest of our Hump Day Hangout team. Um, we've got uh, the nationally, internationally renowned Chief John Salka, which you never have to guess what's on his mind. We've got we've got the best-selling author of 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 the the best-selling book out there, the Functional Fire Company, Chief Scott Thompson, and uh, the Godfather, <laughs> <laughs> and oh. and the Godfather, Michael Corleone, Chief Bobby Halton, uh, the Godfather of the Fire Service. Uh, he's got all the families. He's got all the families from fire engineering to fire apparatus to gems to firefighter nation to FDIC. He's got all the families, if you will. But uh, amazing. In fact, here come here comes uh here comes Michael Corleone. Here comes Bobby right now. But Chief, I just referred to you as the Godfather of Fire Service, uh, Michael Corleone. So that's your new name, uh, Bobby, for for all of us. But uh, you got all the families, all the families. I I was uh we did a little TikTok promo for the show today for Pete, and I'm looking at the menu tabs and I go just scrolling above the websites. I go. It's it's Michael Corleone, you know, without the without the hat. He's got all the families underneath him, you know, gems and FDIC and Firefighter Nation and all that. So can I jump in here once one quick second? And I just want to reiterate to the world that Rick Lasky and John Salk are on TikTok. <laughs> well, I was ordered to TikTok. By, What's by TikTok? our producer. <laughs> our producer our producer Pete. Pete is the one that uh that, that talked me into it. So, uh, but so, so welcome everybody. We've got another great show lined up for you. Uh, we always do this as a reminder. If you have any questions, take a ride over to Twitter and send them out our way. I, I watch and Pete watches and he sends them uh, to us. We try to get to him. Just make sure you add hashtag F E talk. Uh, today, our topic is the future leadership of the fire service from firefighter to company officer to chief, what you can do to prepare for that role and what you can do to make a difference. So welcome back guys. And, and Bobby, I want to I want to throw something to you real quick. Um, you just uh, there, big big hot topic right now among other topics, uh, the whole lithium battery thing. And uh, uh, you were just at the at the Rock, right? FDNY, you were there. And everything I've seen, I wasn't able to attend. Pretty phenomenal training, especially because it looks like they've been getting hit the hardest with all these fires with the lithium batteries. But uh, some great information coming out of that conference. What was it not? So I, I apologize. I've uh, got a little throat issue, but um, I thought you were imitating the Godfather again. You're trying to talk like you know Michael's. Uh, yeah, it's funny. Yeah. <laughs> you said that of all days, right? <laughs> so the the mobile the micro mobility issue is is huge, obviously, because what micro mobility means is those are the um, scooters and e-bikes and the things that skateboards things that people bring into their homes right you know and then they charge <clears throat> and <clears throat> when these batteries go into what's called thermal runaway they can uh, ignite and then because they're packed like eggs in an egg crate the fire propagates right one cell ignites then another then another and the problem with the videos that are out there is that they're um, misleading. The, the fires are much more explosive than they appear. In much more intense, right? Ten times more. Uh, it's uh, my hat, uh, Joe, Joe Jordan, um, 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 Frank Lee, Chuck Downey, um, Jack, the new chief. Uh, my, my hat's off to these guys because they're doing a wonderful job. Uh, Lieutenant Cassidy, uh, Captain Evan, um, can't think of Evan's last name. They just did a fantastic job. Um, the hazmat uh, assistant chief or deputy chief rather, I can't think of his name at the moment either, but wonderful job. The, the symposium is a, a fantastic um, event. Uh, but, uh, and so FDNY again is uh, leading the way as a clearinghouse for this stuff, but it's not a matter of if you're going to go to a lithium ion battery event, it's when. 
currently in Moss, uh, Washington, there are uh, 253 Tesla storage battery walls that are on fire. If you remember in Surprise, Arizona, about two years ago, we had an explosion. You guys remember that fire where the guys went in from Surprise? That was a two megawatt facility, two. The place that's on fire right now is 184 megawatts. So you saw what can happen with two. Imagine 184. The estimates are that this thing could burn for weeks, maybe longer. So these things are, you know, the Generac, Tesla, these battery walls are going in people's homes for their solar collectors, right? People's cars have lithium ion batteries. You're a fellow, a friend from um, St. Louis, uh, John Kerr, just sent me a uh, Tyson uh, rechargeable vacuum, these battery powered vacuums that caught fire in, in their community last, uh, just last week. Uh, your battery powered lithium ion hand tools that we that you have in your, in your garage. Um, all, 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 uh, all of these things are uh, incredibly dangerous. And I thought I'm a little under the weather. Um, well, just the, the information coming out of there, Bobby, was phenomenal. Shameless plug. <laughs> it's shameless, shameless plug hour. I wanted to share this with you guys. I just got done reading this, and I'm going to be sending you guys all a copy of it. And um, it's a phenomenal book. As you can see, it's, you know, it's only 90, uh, okay, it's 100, 192 pages. But, you know, the way it's laid out, it's, you know, uh, just this amazing um, reference book. And as you can see here, the guy has done it. It's a fantastic book. He's done it like alphabetically, right? Like there aren't a lot of cues, but, <laughs> but he found two of them, you know, Queen Post, Quick Lime, Quonset Hut. So I, I, I was, I'm highly, the reason I'm pushing this book and not our usual uh, functional, but, <laughs> functional product, but, but the reason I'm pushing this book today, uh, seriously, is I, I came across it because it's up for a, a second edition. Uh, and, and John, I can't wait to get your uh, feedback on it. It's a really, I think it's a really great book for r really every rank. So I told my guy, uh, Chris, who's going to be sending each one of you guys uh, one of Craig's books because he's doing the update. I'd really like to get your feedback on it because I, I found it just be amazing. And the, and the folks that I've given it to, Likewise, just uh, became instantly enamored with it. But to the lithium ion issue, you know, get a hold of uh, Lieutenant Cassidy in the FDNY hazmat unit. Um, they're more than willing to talk to you, share with you all their PowerPoints and what they've got going on there. The bottom line is we just don't know, we don't really know uh, how to uh, manage them uh, when, they're, when, they're, when there's a large quantity of them on fire. Uh, the, the lady from Tesla's advice was to, which formerly from Tesla, her advice was to, you know, if you had a car on fire, just let it burn. And I said, yeah, well, that doesn't go over well with the mayor. Yeah. I'm, I'm just going to throw that out there. And a lot of us sitting in the room need these jobs. So that, that's not the solution. Um, a lot of product out there, none of it has really proven to be, um, useful. You know, a lot of people are saying, try this, try that. And God bless them for attempting, but uh, not really addressing the issue. Um, and then the, the members from FDNY who had uh, a, a, several um, residential fires involving this, and I guess an eight-year-old uh, girl died earlier this week from a lithium, lithium ion battery fire. Um, I've also said the same thing is these batteries get tossed here and about and the, the fear is going past fire, right? It looks like you've knocked it down and then a fire can erupt behind you. So um, just a, it's a very, uh, 
very important issue for us to try to wrap our hands around. And um, the FDNY gave some great advice about using cell block and how to you know pack overpack them. If you don't have a agreement currently with a uh, reclamation service, somebody you can utilize to um, take this product and, 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 and store it until it's safe enough to uh, recycle and, and break down. You, you need to make that, you need to make that relationship now. Um, you need to find out who in, you know, whether it's, whether it's the colony or Louisville or, you know, John for your uh, community up upstate New York, where you can where you can send these things for safe disposal, because you can't you can't send them to the landfill, and we don't want people putting them in the back of garbage trucks because if they get if they get compressed, they'll explode. They can that can that can trigger the explosion. That's why when the uh, airline people tell you if you drop your phone into the airline seat, not to retrieve it, because if you the mechanism of the airline seat is strong enough to bend it enough to cause it to uh, catch catch fire. Now on, on the aircrafts, they're now carrying these things called envelopes where you can put them in with some water and then hopefully land before they, you know, get out of control. But, um, well, Bobby, that's interesting because, you know, as much as we fly, that's been the latest big thing, you know, that we're all of a sudden make that announcement. If you drop your phone, you know, with a C, ask for our assistance, please do not try to retrieve it. I'm like, I, I hear phones hitting the floor all the time. You know, doo -doo -doo. you hear them all the time on the plane. I'm like, so I, I was, I was curious myself. I mean, and th this is, this is huge. It started off where it was a couple little fires here and there. Now this is just like daily where you're seeing something. And, and like you said, violently, this isn't just, Oh, watch what's going on here. You know, with this soda bottle that we put, you know, tinfoil and sulfuric, you know, that kind of stuff. This is, this is stuff, you know, big time props. Go ahead, John. You know, and, and you know, without, we're, we're getting way off the topic here, but it's just very interesting stuff. Um, and so how we as the fire service handle the fires that are caused by these batteries, that's one issue. You know, I, I want to talk about, I want to, I want to go back and, and look at the issue before the fires and say, you know, like, like Bobby just said, it. well, well how do you handle it? Why don't, you, why don't you just let it burn? You know, like somebody might have said that 40 years about cockloft fires 40 years ago. Oh, why don't you just let them burn? Well, we can't let it burn because then it'll go to the next building, the next building, the next building. We get this big, gigantic fire. So, so we passed laws and said that you have to subdivide cockloffs and you have to put brick nogging in between the two by fours. And, and we handled it that way. So why is the fire service? I mean, I, I understand the fire service taking on the problem of the existing batteries and the fires, and we're going to have to handle that. They're out there already. But why isn't somebody somewhere? Why isn't there some type of laws or some type of standard being written? I mean, NFPA and everybody else, I, mean, I, I don't know who it, would, who it would that would be in charge of this, but there's standards on everything, on how thick your Nomex is going to be, how wide your stripes are. What it, wh why aren't there standards about things? What, why, don't, why aren't we forcing the manufacturers, the, the people that are manufacturing these deadly pieces of equipment that they're spreading all over the country that are causing havoc and fires and death, why is it somewhere, somebody saying, hold on a second, these things are poorly designed, they're dangerous to society, they're, they're outrunning the fire service, let's slow down and maybe these things have to be either built or subdivided or limited in size or something. Maybe somebody with, you know, a white coat and a pair of bifocals is going to have to sit down and restudy this shit. You know what I'm saying? It, 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 obviously, we have to handle the existing stuff, case closed, no, no argument. But for this to continue, th this... This whole electrical battery, I this and I that, it's in its infancy. It's only going to get bigger and better. Now they want every car in America to be battery powered, every truck, every this. I just saw, I just saw battery powered airplanes. Obviously, this thing is going nowhere, but but through the roof, right? I think it's time in the infancy, which is still now, I think, for them to come up with some better design and better construction and 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 more preventative measures on the measures on the you know, on the manufacturing side, rather than just handing it off and sending them out the door and let, let, let's let the fire department figure it out. You know, before, you know, we're going to have whole buildings burning down because somebody brought a scooter into the third floor. You know, it, it seems like we get a, better get a voice somewhere else other than how to put them out. There's that other whole argument that's going to have to be looked at. Well, Bobby, you were there. Like I saw I brought it up because it looked like an incredible, you know, FDOI has always done 
cut edge, great stuff. You know what I'm saying? And you were there to, to the stuff I saw come out of the conference was, was a lot of that kind of information. Cause you know, I mean, we, I know we got to get onto our topic here, but th- this doesn't just, you know, when you see the videos of when it starts off and then it's gone, it's, it, this isn't like, well, I've got 20 minutes to deal with this battery. It, it, it It's when I said violent, I don't even think that's even adequate to describe what happens with these things. Just what John said, Bobby. What are they? What are they saying? You know, like I said before, we move on to our topic today. But I thought this was important because we everybody's talking about. Are, are there are there recommendations? What are they? I guess what is what, they talked about? Like they said, where where are they thinking things are going to go or whatever? To, to John, John, John is exactly spot on. John's exactly right. Uh, I'm I'm writing a piece right now, uh, an open letter that I'm sending to U.S. Fire Administration, NFPA. Uh, the president's council. Um, and basically it's entitled who's in charge here because to John's point, these batteries are ubiquitous it, right now, probably in every room. Well, right here, lithium ion battery. Um, you know, they're in, every single one of us right now is sitting probably in front of, if not one, two or three or four lithium ion battery powered devices. It, 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 well, that's not that one. <laughs> But if you put, all I got, but I'm sure if you bought an electric rechargeable stapler, John, it would be a lithium ion battery. The reason is, is that the lithium ion uh, batteries are so um, effective. They're good at doing what batteries are supposed to do, which is um, store energy. The problem is, uh, and I'm just, I just got a paper today where some scientists in California have figured out a way how to replace the cobalt. Now, the problem with the the, the basic uh, carbon, the metals that they were using prior to the cobalt was the heat, right? Which is our issue. So they think they've figured a way because cobalt mining is basically controlled by the Chinese. It's very dirty, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they're trying to get, they're working on that. But to John's point, these things are ubiquitous. And now we have the do it yourself for people. And there was a scooter, one of those fires, I think it was either the Manhattan fire or the Brooklyn fire. That was a scooter that caught fire to your point, John. People, <clears throat> people bring them inside. And now you've got, and the Manhattan fire was a do-it-yourself repair shop for these lithium ion battery powered mobile devices. But beyond just the mobility devices, vacuum cleaners, hand tools, you, you name it. it, it to Chris Green, who's, our, our in-house SME from Seattle says, if you can recharge it, it's lithium ion. And so um, his big fear to, to Ricky's and John's point is that someone's, you know, you're, you're checking one of these lithium ion deals on the airplane. And if it's in the cargo hold and it catches fire, we're not going to know until it's too late. All right. And, 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 you know, it's already claimed, I believe John, 19 lives I think have been lost in New York or, I might be exaggerating, I might be nine. I have to look at my notes, but it's either nine or 19 people have already succumbed to injuries from these lithium ion battery fires. The other thing we don't know anything about, and right now the alcohol, tobacco and firearms people are looking into it, is what's the toxicity of the runoff when we do extinguish one of these lithium ion batteries? Right. And, and so the Tesla plant that's on fire right now, the, it, it's on fire engineering. I'm, not, I'm just making a pitch for the website, but if you go to the website today, you can see the news release from Moss, I believe it's Washington, Moss, Washington. 253 of these gigantic um, 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 battery storage units are on fire. I mean, you know, it's 182 megawatts, according to Chris, and, and it's a huge problem. So, um, yeah, to, to your point, Terry, it's the law of unintended consequences, right? Where that people are trying to, you know, use the battery as a, you know, alternative to carbon-based fuels, gas and gasoline and natural gas. But, you know, is, is the cure worse than the, than, the, than the disease, right? In other words, are we, are we creating a bigger Frankenstein than the one we already have, right? And um, how do you dispose of these things and the mining that's involved? And then now the fires, um, you know, and the other thing that was interesting is that the only, when these batteries go into thermal runaway, 
you can't tell by looking at them. In other words, you don't know they're in trouble till they start to off gas. And once that happens, it's too late. Yeah. It's Katie bar the door. So, um, wickedly complex problem. Uh, I'm writing my, I'm writing my letter, right in my open letter right now. Um, I, I met with the IAFF president yesterday, Eddie Kelly, about it. Uh, I'm, I'm meeting with the U.S. Fire Administration about it on the 11th. Um, and and uh, I, was, I met with the guys in St. Louis last week, and I'll be up to Salt Lake uh, this week, next week, talking about it. But uh, uh, we got to wrap our heads around it. We've got to figure out what we're doing here. And, and I'm... I'm worried, you know, batteries can come down. The, they can, the, the testing people from ATF said that they've, the individual cells, because they come clustered like a, like a, like a bunch of eggs, like they'd be 20, 30, 60 of them. And when they start exploding, they can go up to 90 feet. 90 feet, you know, you get into an open floor plan business office area. One of them they showed was the, the ladies go to these, um, you know, where you get your fingernails done and the, the hand dryers exp- are word lithium ion and, and one of them exploded at night and burned down a nail salon. Well, I'm sure there were more than one hand drying unit in there, you know, and, and if the firefighters went in, you know, you could knock it all down, come back to a rekindle two or three hours later because the next one blew up or whatever, because it can get, they can get compromised by exposure to heat, impact poor design and overcharging. The overcharging one was really frightening to Frank and, and, and uh, uh, Chief Jordan because they said that, you know, when our phones die, we all go to the Apple store or whatever, or the Samsung store, and we buy the most expensive, best charger we can. No, we go to Amazon and we buy the one we can get for nine ninety five dollars At the gas station. Yeah, the gas station. <clears throat> Right, and that charger could overcharge your phone, could overcharge, and it's the same thing with all our other devices. You know, um, I, I, you know. so anyway, terrifying problem. And to John's point, I don't think anybody's making any effort at this point, John, because the things are so damn efficient and everybody's on this, you know, green thing, which I don't think is green at all. When you look at how they build these green things or anything but green and batteries are probably the least green thing ever invented. So that's the reason it's important for them to do something now because they're so popular, because they're so helpful, because they fit right into this whole new green movement. For those reasons, it's still in its infancy, though. Think of all the things. Just look around. Think of all the things, whether they're commercial and your private dwelling industry. Think of all the things that will be. That all will be eventually powered by batteries rather than by, you know, gasoline or diesel or something. And now's the time to fix it. It's it's going to be. I mean, <clears throat> there's got to be a turning point here where it's going to be, where it's going to be too late. You know, there's going to be the, the whole world to be full of them. And you know, there'll be buses on fire every other street in Manhattan, every other city in America. Cars on fire. Little volunteer fire departments, suburban paid departments, and not even going to be able to handle it. Well, Bobby. Wow. So so before we move on here. Uh, Good contact for people to uh, to contact the FDNY. You said repeat that again if they're looking for some information. Yeah, it's the FDNY hazmat unit, but you want to go to the New York City Fire Department Foundation, the, the fire the the foundation website, John. It's just called New York City Fire Fire Department. Yeah, FDNY Foundation. Yeah, FDNY Foundation. Go to that website. They list all the symposium. I even think the link to all the. PowerPoints that were presented were there. If not, I'll send that link to Pete and he can put it up. They're, they're giving away the, they're, all the PowerPoints are there for you to see. All the information's out there. Lieutenant Cassidy, um, I'm, John, the, the chief of hazmat, I'm, but it's Leecher, I'm forgetting his name, wonderful guy, great presenter. Um, it, they, they, they want you all to just take it, use it, look at it, contact them. Go to the found, FDMY Foundation, look, look for when the next symposium's coming up. Lieutenant Cassidy is, uh, was the kind of the lead guy uh, during the uh, presentation. Um, Chief Lieb is there. You know, you can contact his office. They'll put you in charge. But they're, they're asking people to, um, you know, it's more fingers on the knife. Somebody's going to, you know, the more information we get, um, the better, right? Like this, I sent, uh, I sent this information to them about this Dyson 
uh, back and, and not disrespecting the Dyson company. They're, they're using you know, batteries like everybody else. It's a, no, just not, it's, this is not a diss on Dyson by any shakes of the imagination, great products, whatever. But I don't know that Dyson's making the batteries, you know what I mean? The, the batteries could be being produced, you know, somewhere other, you know, right. I'm sure Dyson doesn't make their own damn batteries. That's right, right, right. So well, yeah, FDNY Foundation, um, I'll get, I'll get that link to, um, to Pete, so you can put up at the end of the uh, uh, the show today, so folks can can look at it. Um, and then the, my buddy at the ATF, all, all the powerpoints are in there. Uh, Michael Abrams is doing studies because the the fellow from Hicksville, Long Island, uh, one of the chiefs there, he brought up a great question. He said to the that's where the Tesla lady he said just let it burn, and she's a former Tesla lady, nice lady too. God bless her, wonderful person, but she's not connected to what we're doing, right? And so she said, you know, if, the, if it's out in the open, just let the car burn rather than putting water on it because the, the chief was worried about, apparently Hicksville has its own uh, aquifer and he was very worried about contaminating his aquifer as he should be, right? And so we don't know what the toxicity, but I can't, she said, well, it's probably not any more toxic than a house fire today. Well, the house fires today can be pretty damn toxic. Yeah. So that wasn't a good answer. So we're well, the information's there. <clears throat> Excuse me, the information's there. Um, you know, here we're we're, we're going to be talking our topic here in a second. Here, perfect perfect way to lead in. Talk about you know the fire service and the leadership of the fire service trying to figure their way through another challenge. Another look, we're just working our way out of a pandemic. They had to figure. I, I mean, for for since Ben Franklin created the, the volunteer fire service, seventeen thirty six, we've been figuring out shit, figuring out stuff. And here's another thing that the fire service is going to step up and, and they'll figure it out just like they've done everything else, but it needs the attention. Just like, just like Bobby said that, you know, we've got to pay attention to what's going on and we've got to get all our, you know, people together. As he said, we, you know, the Godfather said, we have to have a sit down, you know, and uh, everybody's got to sit down and figure this stuff out. So yeah. Bobby, thanks for, thanks for starting it off like that. I, I had that in my note to ask you as soon as you came on, because yeah, the, thanks the, for throwing up some more shit, Bob. <laughs> and you know what? That first of all, that book for the for the leaders out there. How many times at this show have we talked about knowing your buildings? You know, I mean, John has said it umpteen times. The first time, you know, you're you're in a building should be the first time it's on fire. Know your buildings, know the enemy. So that's awesome. But so anyway, we're hey, we're talking leadership. Actually, we're talking fire source leadership today. Uh, where we see it going in the future. More most importantly, how you can get there and then you know how to be successful in that leadership position and i, I guess we can start this off with some ideas from from our, our group um you know for the future for the people that are paying attention people are listening um john you and i start our company officer camp we everybody here's been teaching company officer stuff for for decades but we 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 fine-tune that because we realized you know, it's, it's chapter one of the leadership, but we did that. We're just, we just, we're not doing our job preparing people. We get them, we front load everybody to be a firefighter, put them through academies, EMT, sometimes paramedic, hazmat this, hazmat that, all these different things. And, and, and then we, they, there's a little bump in the road a couple years later, they make driver. And then we always ask, you know, how many times the class would go? So what do you remember from the class you were sent to on how to be a company officer? What do you, so we, we, we promote people, put them in the front seat and, the majority of the fire service does nothing for that person. And then you promote them to battalion chief, assistant deputy, division, uh, you know, you know, district chief, chief of department. Right now you go, besides the National Fire Academy, besides your state association, besides FDIC, you know, right now, we're, you know, if you want to go this month, you know, or next month for class on, on how to be a chief, they're, they're few and far between. So, you know, we're actually not doing our job, our due diligence field to prepare the future of the fire service. So it's hard for people to get there. So I think a lot of people are guessing. A lot of people are rushing. Um, let, let's just go. Let's start. Uh, Scott, we'll do you, Bobby, Terry, Terry you know, or, and, and John. You know, we're talking leadership. What, what, what is your suggestion to kick the ball going here, if you will, what they should be thinking about? If you have someone sitting there going, you know, Chief, and, and you know, the email I got the other day, I'm thinking about moving up. But it's hard, you know. You can Google it. You can look. There's all kinds of things out there. But what makes the best candidate to to promote up into that position, whether it's company officer and or chief, the future of the leadership of the fire service? Rick, you packaged it 
very nicely in, in everything you said. Uh, just two quick stories that we're dealing with that I think highlight this is we've been working on a project now. We're calling it Trumpets 1 and 2, and it's going to be our, our officer development. Trumpets 1 will be prior to promotion. Trumpets 2 will be, be after. Um, but we, we had I had two very respected captains come in to me. We were getting ready to do promotions for Station 5, which will be our last firehouse. And our core values are duty, respect, integrity. You know, everybody has theirs. But our promotions in the past have been very heavy on tactics and strategy stuff, fire ground stuff, which, which is very important. We, we all know that. But the, these two officers came in and, and they had the, 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 uh, the backing of the organization. Chief, we would really like to change the promotional process to have a lot more that have to do with our, our core values, duty, respect, integrity. In other words, let's make that kind of the priority in this process. So it's kind of a grassroots thing in our organization that, that they see the need. You know, uh, we've talked the first part of this show is this job isn't getting any easier. It's getting more and more complex, not only from the fire environment, but people are getting more complex. I, I think it's more difficult to lead and manage in this day and age than it probably ever has just because you got so many different uh, variations. So you know, we're really looking at things like uh, emotional intelligence and, and, and uh, you know, really defining what is two-way trust, you know, starting with, with you know, Aaron Fields is always a big thing about, you know, let's talk about a common terminology and, and talk about some of these things. And so we're really trying with Trumpets 1 and 2 is, is go back to the start and really look at what are the things that our people have to know to be successful. And it's, it's, it's not rocket science. And as you mentioned, it's stuff that we just kind of took for granted. I remember, you know, several times, hey, you know, take the test. Your, your badge comes through inner office mail and your new front shield for your helmet. And boom, you're the guy now. And, and you, you got to wing it or talk to your deals. You know, I'm a huge believer in, in mentoring and coaching. I, I think, um, you know, I've said it again and again. I believe mentoring is a future of fire service learning and leadership. And, and we've got to do a better job, not only with classes like you and John present, and Bobby and, you know, um, with, with great, uh, curriculum, but also I think you got to have that one-on-one -on -one where there's a lot of shadowing and mentoring and coaching where there's this almost one-on-one -on -one relationship so that you hit all the, 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 the micro, I guess, if you will, uh, aspects of, of what's required on the day in and day out. I call it a run in the firehouse business. You know, that's, that's the challenge, why the paperwork is important, and we don't want to go to that extreme, but making sure everybody understands the expectations. And then another area, that we don't do well in is, is we get these things in place and we don't hold people accountable. Then we have an accountability issue and all that, you know, if, if you define leadership as influence, which John Maxwell does and, and, you know, certainly buy into is, are you being a positive influence or a negative? But, but I think emotional intelligence, you know, talking about maturity and how people develop and go through the seasons of their life and, and what things you need to be giving them as they advance is, is huge. And, 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 you know, uh, human nature, um, uh, people, everybody has their own personal core values and professional goals and, and, and this, this family work uh, balance. All those things, I think, are part of, of what the company officer at that level, the first promotion, has to really think about and consider if we want our people to reach their full potential and we don't want to have this huge retention, uh, uh, you know, this turnover thing like the whole a fire service experience. A lot of that is is because of poor leadership, poor supervision. I'm telling you right now, I don't I don't think a lot will agree with me, but the reason why people are staying and leaving organizations, it's not as much as a compensation thing as it is a leadership and and supervision thing. But that's oh, that's we, kind of my seen, thought. We've seen that for years, you know, and and you make a great point there as well, Scott. With you know, John, how many times have you said, you know, when we talk leadership, we're not you don't lead fire engines, you lead people. And I've heard you say it, and we both said that, you know, as, as much as fire firefighting, you know, go to a job or whatever is important, it's a bullet point on the job description. Every bit of it that we do before that, back in the firehouse, leading our people, setting the tempo, you, all of us spend so much time, you know, grooming and teaching leadership, teaching it. I'll say, it, you know, you, you look towards the end of our company, Austin Academy, John, we spend a fraction of the time on scenarios and we spend the majority on how to lead people. I remember you saying that once. It's like, you don't lead fire ins, You don't lead ladder trucks. You, you, you lead people. So Right. right. And, and like Scott just said, I mean, I mean, I mean, I have a page full of stuff on leadership. I mean, the, the question I ask and you ask at, at a couple of our different programs about leadership is, 
What's the, what's the greatest thing about leadership? What's the greatest thing about teaching leadership? Maybe even about learning leadership is it's not science. It's not math. There are no formulas. It's wide open. If there are a hundred books on leadership, 99 of them say something different than the other 98, which is wonderful and terrible at the same time. If there was a formula, you could start to learn it. You could pass it. You know, you, you didn't hear that leadership formula. You do this and this, and the guys just start to pick it up. But instead, it's wide open. There's stuff that you do or you did in Louisville. You guys are doing in Louisville now. And there's stuff that, that you're doing in your department and Bobby was doing out there in Albuquerque and I was doing an FDNY or South Lima Grove. There's stuff that you do that I would never do. There's stuff that, that I got away with and that the FDNY got away with for years that would, that would cause other fire departments to implode and explode and everybody be fired and a couple <laughs> go to jail, you know, and we got, and, and, and we did it and we put fires out really good doing it. So my whole point is things are so dramatically different. And then you start looking at stuff. And I think we need to do this. I mean, I have I have all sorts of bookcases. You have all my leadership stuff in one in one you know one shelf. Military leadership, fire service leadership, business leadership, sports leadership, political leadership. Everybody's got their own angle. Uh, you just mentioned uh, uh, non common terminology. Everybody's got their own terms and their own slang words for how to how to do things. It's really getting quite quite complex. And I think one of the major problems is what you just talked about. Uh, Scott, ac accountability, you know, like buddy to boss, that's right on, but that's the old fashioned version of it. You know, like, unfortunately, people are going to disagree with me. You know, the cops got it right. The Marines have it right. You know what? It, you can't be, you can't be the friend and the boss at the same time. And, and, and then we got this big thing that's always lurking over our heads, this big word brotherhood. And everybody gets confused. Holy crap. How can we be all brothers when, when you're the captain, you know, and we're the firefighters and we want to do this and this and this, and you keep saying no, and you don't smile at us. And how come we didn't get invited to the barbecue? And, and, you know, some people don't have a problem with that stuff. Some, some police captains don't have a problem with it. officer Jones. Are you done? Get out on patrol. And, and that's the end of the story. And the guy does his job. And I, I guess I'm preaching the same old crap. I always preach, you know what I'm saying? Like, Old school is good. And the way the old fashioned bosses got, got things done. I still think it's good, effective. You know, the tough boss is a great boss and, and there's ways for us, ways for us to weave in some more humanity and maybe to do it with a smile instead of a frown and, or a growl. But for God's sakes, accountability is everything. If people aren't, if people aren't corrected, if people aren't scolded, if people aren't brought off to the side or brought upstairs once in a while, then they're going to do what they damn well please, especially in a place like a firehouse. That's, that's very, unaccountable most of the time the officer's not wandering around most of the time they're upstairs doing this or outside doing that and i don't know it, you it, said it, it once it, before oh. about the cops john you said about the cops you go you know the, the patrol officers aren't riding with lieutenant or sergeant they they didn't they didn't make their they just didn't get done cooking your meal they're not watching a movie together not working out so it's a little bit easier i know when i do the law enforcement class i'm getting ready next week to do one you know I, they look at you like no i had to write i mean there's it's a whole different world there on how we weave this um, Terry, going to what, what John said uh, on top of what, what Scott said about you guys are doing something when you, you talk about building the future and leadership in, in the fire service in Louisville, you know, I, I want to mention somebody, John Copeland is one of my favorites. And I remember asking Cope a long time ago, cause he always wants to be like the senior guy who signed a new firefighter. Why is this so important for you to mentor? And I'll never forget this T he said, cause I want to have a say in the future of my fire department. He wants to mentor people so he has a say in the future of his fire department, you know, to have to have an opportunity. But you guys, going back to what Scott said, you know, again, look, fighting fires and all stuff, that's all that's all important and knowledge you have to have. But every bit of what we do really does start back in that firehouse, how we lead our people, what we do and how we prepare for it. You guys, we did a whole show here. Everybody was here for the Louisville Fire Department Creed. And not only do it right, not only do let's just talk promotional exams, people are promoting into those leadership positions. Not only do they have to know all 10 points and know the words to each one, they have to be able to explain. Like if you in a promotion, uh, Chief McNeil says, uh, so you know, Bobby, uh, give me explain to me number two, number seven, number nine of the fire department creed. And he he can't just recite word for word the sense, he has to actually say it and then explain the mean, right? You guys are doing that from the very get-go with your with your rookies, right? Yeah, and 
You know, I've got, I guess, a, a mixed opinion on that because I think anybody can be can be sat down and said, learn this, recite this. And and you you should, if you're getting ready for a promotional exam, you should be practicing what your responses and what you think the questions are going to be. And all of that's all well and good. Scott brought up something and 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 I think some of these shows could be just condensed down to like 10 minutes to just ask the question, ask Chief Salka to give an answer because I'm all in on what Chief Salka said. I'll make a couple of points here, Chief. Years ago, one of the best things that you ever did for this department was take our BCs and our FITs and you sent them to FDMY to ride out with Chief Salka. Consistently, every one of them came back. And you know what? You did not They would certainly relay great stories. Oh, yeah, man, we saw Rescue 2 and this and this. We saw we went to a job or, or this happened or whatever. But what was the most consistent thing said? F-bomb is part of the language of FDNY, right? And they use it in every contextual matter that you can think of. And when they're done using it, they have coffee and they're all friends. They get their point across and no one wears their feelings on there. You know what I mean? It's it, it and, and they to this day, the ones that went up there talk about that visit and how, holy shit, I don't know that I could talk to somebody that way down here. Right. <laughs> but, the, but the point to all that is, is that and, and I'll get back to you, chief, working for you. You are a, a very different leader than I have had. Uh, and, and I've had many supervisors, whether in a fire station, a police police department, whatever the case may be. I never wanted to let you down. I don't to this day. You had a lot of fire and emotion in what you did, and you levied expectations, but most importantly, you held people to those expectations. And if you came up short, you were going to hear about it. Now, some guys walk away from that traumatized. They need to go sit in the corner with a kitten and, oh, my God, he yelled at me and, you know, whatever. But listen, I walk away from that going, hey, note to self, that, that shit's never going to happen again. When I walked into a meeting, I was prepared. And when I walked in there, I had answers to questions. I did exactly what I do. If you're going to take a promotional exam, you sit and you practice an answer to a question. I'm telling you, I did that before staff meetings. I wonder what we're going to talk about. I wonder what he could ask me. But I'm going to have my, my stuff together when I walk in there. So that expectations and accountability and holding people accountable. I think everyone in here, as a parent, you've heard kids need boundaries. They don't operate well when you just let them loose, right? But but for some reason, we have a lot of supervisors in a firehouse that that's the way they operate. They have no boundaries and their their guys are just everywhere. And then when you set them down and, and the, the phrase I love the most around here is, well, well, I was just trying to look out for my guys. I said, hey, that's exactly what I want you to do. And sometimes that means holding them accountable. Sometimes that means setting them down, pointing a finger at them and saying, what the F are you doing? Don't ever do that again. And, and I think to me, the, the, the only other point I'll make is that I want people to think organizationally and not individually. Think of the organization, your decisions you make, the things that you are doing, holding your people accountable. That makes us a better organization. And ultimately, we all want to deliver better service. We want to be efficient. We want to be known as awesome. Whether you're fighting fire, just discipline, you get off the rig, you look good. Chief, you talk about uh, 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 who is it? Sacramento all the time. Uh, uh, Stockton, about, Stockton and Wichita. I'm, I'm sorry, Stockton. My, my apologies. So, but you talk about them all the time because they have a swagger or way they do business. That's how everyone wants to be known. And part of that is just like watching the Marine Corps. They are high and tight. When you see them do something in a formation, whether it's this, whether it's the band playing the national anthem or it's the silent drill team, it's incredible. It's discipline, it's hard work, and it's taking some pride in what you do. And it is organizationally, you are standing up next to the guy next to you and you're not going to let him down. Well, and, and one of the things, and I mentioned this once before, you know, you know me, we're all best friends here. I, I love Motown and I, you know, I, I love Detroit. I love the Detroit, you know, folks up there. But Barry Gordy, the creator of Motown, one of the keys to his success that out of all the things, kind of like the Paul Leadership Doctrine was competition breeds champions. And I, I, I never want, I, I just didn't want to settle for Louisville being almost as good as East Mudflat. You know what I'm saying? I, we want to either want to be the best or you don't want to be in it. And I, I just can't, I, I've never been picked, played football, baseball, wrestle. I've never been picked second in my life. I've never been like, oh, we'll put him in right field. I've always wanted to be the one. We've talked about this, that the chief says, Lassie, get your, come over, reaches through. But my question, I'll ask Bobby this. 
you know, Bobby, you're, you're again, I just said, you're, you know, we're all, we're all great friends here. You're one of my best friends, but you're also my boss. And I know the difference. And I, I, John, I describe it with Bill Allen, my Lieutenant from Bedford park, the, the, the most incredible company officer I ever worked for in my life. Kind of like you said, Pete Lund, I wasn't afraid of him. I feared disappointing him. Like you said, Terry, Bobby, I, and I'll, I'll point to you and ask you, how do, what do we do? I, I, I kind of, I mean, I don't fear my boss, Chief Bobby Halton. I fear disappointing you. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm like, God, I don't want to do a class FDIC with John. And maybe, it did. you know, you know, I'm always like, you know what I'm saying? And I, I, I think sometimes that's the right kind of fear to have. Like you don't want to disappoint your parents because you got money in the bank. You don't want to disappoint your boss, your leader. It's not, I'm scared. I'm going to get yelled. At. It's like, I just, I, I get so angry at myself if I feel like I've disappointed someone I work for. My question is, do you still think that plays an important role in the development of our leadership to get people to a point where they respect, respect is a two-way street, right? Up and down. But what do we have to do to get people to a point, Bobby, where, you know what, I, I, I'm working towards money to bank my bosses, not kissing ass, but you know what, and more fearful of disappointing than by getting, look, I got to scold the plane times we're doing shit wrong. And I, you know, but I don't know if that plays enough into it or not, but I, I want to hear from you, Bobby. I guess the first question to ask Lasky is, other than today, how long have you been working at fire engineering? So, Since 1995. <laughs> <laughs> it was a nice run, Bobby. <laughs> the old, that's the old, this is your last day question. Um, so to your point, I think that we forget, and to John's point, is that we enjoy reading about leadership and we enjoy reading about you know, how others have managed events and how they, how they do this because self-knowledge and success are completely entwined. In other words, you have to have a high degree of self-knowledge. In other words, who are you? What do you stand for? What do you really want? Now, FDIC is pretty straightforward about that. Fire engineering is pretty straightforward about that. The fire service, to John's point, is anything but in other words, we've had people that have stood for popularity or celebrity, but in terms of excellence, you know, they, we all talk about it, but then when we run into bosses that demand it, well, that guy's an asshole. Right. And, and I get to be an asshole every April for, well, no, not April, I guess it's a, every July for July and August, I get to be the world's most hated man, as Rick calls me. So you got to look at what are your weaknesses, especially your bad habits. You've got to have an integrated worldview. What's your value system? And then you have to have a profound respect for others and for creation. And without that, you don't know what you're doing. And the most important thing that I think we've been talking about here is self-knowledge and success is predicated on who we select, right? And I don't mean that we have to have all choir boys or people with perfect records, I think outliers or regulars are really, really important. And if you look at the success of most organizations, it's not from the, the most conforming people. It's from the people who, to, 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 to Terry's point earlier and John's point, that you have to wrangle from time to time because they are so inquisitive. They are so dynamic. They are so, you know, uh, out there. So selecting is key. And then training. If we really were going to be serious about the fire service, we wouldn't invest 80% of our money in fire prevention, or we would put 80 or 85% of our time into training, into training everybody, but especially recruits. Our ongoing success depends on training recruits into leaders. And if we solve that problem, the molded will solve every other problem. To, 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 to the mentoring point you made earlier, that's exactly what that person's doing. Our ongoing success isn't what we're going to do. It's what the people that we're training today and we're molding today, what they're going to do. So, and you have to help them on that journey to self-knowledge. And we go all over the place. You know, we all laugh about our youth and they say, if you weren't a liberal when you were a kid, you didn't have a heart. And if you aren't a conservative as an adult, you don't have a brain. And part of that is true. You know, I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a move. Conservatism means you want to preserve what's working and, and, and make it, you know, go on in perpetuity. So I think that to everyone's point, the leadership struggle is figuring out how to turn every single firefighter 
that we hire into a good leader because we're all leading all the time. The question is whether you're doing it well or poorly. That's the only question. Well, I, I got a point that's going to build. I, I just want to, before I forget it, because I've thought about five things that I forgot about already, but um, <laughs> I, I want to I mention something that Bobby said that actually been said a couple of times by a couple of people. The first one is the people that are joining, being recruited, being tested, coming on board the fire service today are not the same people that came on five or 10 years ago or 20 years ago. It's a different set of people. You know, 20 years ago, a guy joined, he was coming maybe from another fire department, or maybe he was a volunteer in his hometown for a few years. They were into it. They loved it. They grew up, you know, squad 51 and all this other stuff, all this stuff that we all lived, right? Well, we, oh, God, since, since I could walk, I wanted to be a firefighter. Joey D driving, you know, with his little, with his little ride on fire trucks, right? Now it's different. Society is different. People are different. I think our candidates are different. I, I think our fire service is different because the entry door that you always talk about, who's coming in the door, they're different. I think people are looking at it and saying, well, I could be a cop. Let me see. I could be a state trooper. They write it down on a yellow pad. I could be a, I could be a firefighter in Louisville. They write that down on the pad. Salary, benefits, retirement, uh, distance traveling, shifts, worked, appearances. Oh, let me see what the bus driver job is at. And let me see. I thought about being a welder. I did that too. And then they pick. Looks like I'm going to go with firefighter they, because the firefighter is the good job, the best job, the best pension, the highest pay, the least appearances. Also, you got this guy that doesn't know what a halogen is or what laid rope is or what, I, what you know. And so the people are different. That, that's one thing. The next thing is, and, and Bobby just touched on it with training. And I, I think you've been doing it in Louisville and I'm sure they're still doing it. You know, you train your people all to take the next job and, you know, in whatever job they're in. We, we got to do some promotional pre-planning. I don't think it should just be a matter of like, well, like Billy Bob comes into the office, how you doing, Cap? I think I'm going to quit smoking. I'm going to study for lieutenant. You know, like the guy's got 12 years on a job. Suddenly he wants to be a lieutenant. You know, the military, for those that have been in the military, and I haven't, but two of my boys are in the military. For the military, they, they, like there's a road to promotion. you got to start studying. you got to do correspondence courses. you got to get some training done. you got to check the boxes. You know, matter of fact, they just throw you out of the military if you don't keep moving up, the, the, you know. Maybe we should start something like that, or maybe each department should look at something like that early on in your career. Maybe you have to set your sights early. It shouldn't just be like, I'm going to quit drinking and be a boss, you know? Like maybe it should be a little bit of a long term uh, commitment. Maybe the fire department should let people know. And if you're interested in being a lieutenant somewhere, you got to have nine years in a job. And when you have five years, you have to start the process. And here's the classes you got to go to, here's the certifications you got to get. So instead of saying, gee, how come we don't train our lieutenants when we make lieutenant? Guess what? They're, they're in four years of training before they even take a lieutenant's test or before they even throw their name into the promotional process because they're already, we can already see that they're qualified by the time they jump into the process rather than a guy jumping into the process and failing or not. You know, go ahead. Great, great point. Go ahead, Bobby. John, I think you're exactly right there. I think that, you know, we were, I was at The Rock and they were telling me how the academy used to be. 26 weeks and now it's down to 21 i think it should be two years or you know i mean if we're really going to invest in somebody maybe it needs to be a year or maybe 18 months maybe two years and then i think that you're right i think that the 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 decision or the or the process for promotion should should be based upon past performance it should be based upon achieving certain benchmarks if you will i mean it ought to be it just should be oh you've been here three years you can take the test bullshit you you probably should have had a evaluation that was you know above a certain standard you should probably have achieved certain the whole picture right in other words and, and again i think it goes to the our point our success depends on turning our people into real leaders you know what i mean not not and 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 and, and, and john and i have and Ricky, we have tremendous exposure to the military and we're blessed for it. And the, the thing that always kills me when people say we're paramilitary or we're about as para as it freaking gets. Um, because to John's point, you know, the way the military structures its systems is, is, is highly structured and they invest 85% of their effort into training, period. And, and that training is partially preparing people for the next level. And if they don't, if they don't, succeed in that training they don't get to compete they don't just because you've been here three years doesn't mean you can be a lieutenant or five years or 10 years or 20 years you, you have to you have to be what we need in a lieutenant before you become a lieutenant 
Well, and, and we're seeing this, you know, and we talk about this all the time, the balance that you have to have some of the best, some, some of the headhunters I work for and trying to help them find fire chiefs, which has been the ultimate challenge lately, is trying to find some <laughs> of these places, fire chiefs that are not just the resume maker that they come in and you look at his resume and they have all this. It's finding those that strike that balance. And, and one of the, the best ones said, Rick, sometimes the best job postings when it says bachelor's in this, master's in this, CFO, EFO, blah, blah, blah. And the very last catch is a combination of education and experience will be considered because you've got people that might be six months away from finishing a degree or they've got this much time. Look at the whole picture because, and he used to say, don't find me someone who looks great on paper but doesn't look good on experience and three years from now they're going to have a vulnerable confidence on. So that's one thing is for, for, for those that are viewing because, you know, we've got some great comments coming on board and we talk about the balance of education experience and understand what servant leadership is. I think a big one is empathy. And that is in order to be a good boss, a great leader, that's remembering what you, everybody here talked about when I was, when I went back, what, you know, today, all of us go back and remember. And, and I, and we talk about in our classes and our teachings and our mentoring that you need to remember where you were at at one time. You remember what it was like to have, you know, living from paycheck to paycheck, a new marriage, working a side job, a new baby at home, whatever, studying and studying, dying on the list, dying on the list. You know, Terry, I tell that story, Scott, of Gary Apple, when Butch Flanagan, one of my absolute favorite captains of all time, came in and said, boss, it's time. And, and Scott, Terry, you remember, I had him call Gary. I said, you call him. You call him because he died on that list over and over. He was at the top, but it just never was in the cards. Great, great guy. Retires a great captain. And I remember Butch called him. Apple, Butch, you know, I'm doing, I'm gone. And 10 minutes later, he stand at my door soaking wet from sweat with grass clippings on because he had a lawnmower business. He goes, you better not be effing with me. This better be, uh, you know, you know. I, I just think understanding what it what it takes to get into those positions and and what it what it means to study, you know, to be able to find those people. But then what happens? And and, and um, Christopher Montgomery talked about you know egos and self interest. We've talked about this all the time. You mentioned John Maxwell. John Maxwell talks about all the time. Five things that, that that leaders do wrong. They put, you know, they put themselves above the people, blah, blah, blah. They manipulate instead of motivating their people. There's a lot of fire chiefs out there. Just look for them on social media, they have nine foot arms. Oh my goodness gracious. You know, Bobby, you and I had this talk the other day. Bobby's out there because he has to be next to his job. He he is, he is, you know, all kid aside, I call him the godfather of the fire service. He's in a position to help us influence our 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 place, what we're doing tremendously he needs to be out there you need to see his hear his voice some of these guys it's the one that's like you know i'm so proud to have accepted the leadership award from the kiwanis no it's a pen set you got because you were their guest speaker for 10 minutes and you're not and, and we john you and i did a show on this you, you it's one thing to say you're honored that they made you honorary chief you're not humble when you're posting a picture of yourself with the award in your hand you know and and some of the and i and I've said this, I, I, and I'm not to embarrass John about John's experience. You know, I say it all the time. He doesn't have to tell you about the fires he went to. And he went to a shit load because a lion doesn't have to tell you he's a lion. You know. And, and the bosses the I admire the most were, I'm telling you, the ones that, I, I'll ask you guys this. The bosses that seem to be the most successful bosses in the fire service, the ones we work for and around, are not the mealy mouth, sit over in the corner, not say nothing, let people get away with murder stuff. They're the ones that stamp people in their heads when they need to. They're the ones that have no problem sitting down and going, Terry, or Scott, come here, what, what were you thinking? What we really do? No, this is not, you know, I used to say this, John, you've heard me say this in class for Gary Apple used to say it. We'd be at a, we'd be at a job, ter Terry and Scott Louisville, and things would be going right. And I would just sit there and I wouldn't even look at, and I would say out loud, we're so much better than this. We're so much better than this. And I always thought, what can we, what can we do to be better? But we're so much better. So if you have high expectations for your organization, for your people, you know what? Coaching loud once in a while is okay. And, and John, you and I did a show call on tough bosses. Sometimes, you know, holding hands and singing songs is all good. But, you know, all the people who have been successful at fire service, the Tom Brennans, all these people, the, even Al Bernicini, the, Al Bernicini didn't put up with shit. You know, I, I mean, you know, they're all the great but, bosses. But you got to remember, Alan Brunacini couldn't have been more different than than Tom Brennan, and they were both wonderful, yes. excellent bosses within their own departments, within their own company, when they were company officers, and for the National Fire Service. And the same thing is true for all of us. 
bosses just have to be effective. This is measured by results. It's not measured by the process. It's not measured by the style. You know, Pete Lund was not John Vigiano. They were totally different from each other. I love both of them. I loved working for both of them. And they both produced some of the best firefighters and, and one of the most effective company officers I, I ever was with. And they were nothing like each other. So the lesson here is, like I said in the beginning, there's no book. There's no formula. It's all different. You go to Louisville, engine one, the A shift and the B shift, the bosses can be dramatically different and both be excellent bosses. And that's what we have to, you know, that's what we have to teach people. Obviously, there's got to be some standard. We want to get people to get classes under their belt. We want to get working ahead of time before people take a test and start developing and seeing what their skills are, obviously. But but everybody's going to be a little bit different, you know? Well, and I was, you met him. Eric Fett, uh, the lieutenant, going to be a captain, John, uh, from Detroit, Engine 58. You and I had dinner with Lashmer there. I, we had dinner at the firehouse with him and all the all the big chiefs. You know him. He's about as passionate as they come in. You get him going, and he is loud. But some of that's an act. Some of that's him sending a message. Because I watched him with some of the rookies, the probies in his firehouse, and some of the kids that are riding out. A gentleman, but a boss and a leader, you know, passionate about, you know, the job. You know, but someone, I, I sat there going, God, I, I, I love him. I wish I could be a firefighter and work for this guy. You and I've said, how many times guys have we said at classes going, holy crap, I, I'd, I'd love to work for that guy. And the question is why? And it's not because they let me skip out and show up late, wear my uniform like crap and all that stuff. You know, I, I had this six months. I got transferred to another ship because I, I was jealous that they didn't do shit. They didn't do nothing. I was like, God, I want to, you know, I want to my Bill Allen. Oh my God, Bill, we did this. We did this. We're trained. And if, six months later, I couldn't wait to get back because I, I got transferred to the Island of Misfit Toys and I got tired of not being, all of a sudden I'm not being picked first at calls. I'm like, I'm like, and I look around, I go, Oh, cause I'm hanging with the Jamokes here. I want to go back where I have a lieutenant who busts my ass about training, about checking the rigs, about showing up early, about wearing my uniform. You know, like you said, uh, we talked about Jay Jonas, the captain serious, you know, like, you know, no, you better have a uniform shirt on. You, and we train every day. We do this because this isn't about us. It's about those people out there. And if you're not the best, if you're not, I don't want to be around you if you're not the best. And if you're thinking about promoting, there are classes you should be going. You should get in your car and your pickup truck and you should drive and go to FDIC or go when someone's teaching a class somewhere instead of waiting to be sent somewhere. If you wanted the, the leaders I know that are great leaders, they they sold some some initiative. They they got off their ass and they went out and they found things. They did things. You know, we Bobby, we have people that teach for you now who came to FDIC. Larry McCormick was a helper. He wasn't even supposed to be there. He was a helper, John, in our in our firefighter safety survival program for years. And the next thing you know, he started teaching. Next thing you know, he started boom. And then the next thing he's get he's getting an award from you, Bobby, for saving a, fire, a firefighter's life. On his own, friend, you guys, can I sleep in your hotel room on the floor? Can I? Great know, example. Great yeah, example. Guys that show the initiative to go out and, and grab a hold of this stuff and, and want to be the best leaders. They read the books, you know. Remember Billy yeah. Craddock? Remember yeah. Billy Craddock? Yeah. yeah. There's yep. another yeah. one. Yep. The, yep. You know, and it's the ones that show up and go, you know, Bobby, you see him in the hallways at FDIC, you see him in your travels that just, they, they're they ate up with the job. And you don't have to love it like I do, but but you got to love it. If, if People who don't love what they do suck at what they do. So if you want to be good and have a say in the future, start preparing early. I, I talk about all the time, start preparing early in your career. Once you get settled as a probie, you're doing other stuff. You know, you got to start reading, thinking like John said, I, you know what? Well, one day I want to be a lieutenant. Well, I better start reading something about that stuff. And one day I'm as a lieutenant, I'm going to be a captain. Well, I better start. I remember Donnie Hayde when he got promoted to lieutenant, John. I remember that. Okay. Donnie Hayde got promoted to lieutenant. And that he was goes, a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> he goes, he goes, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take, I'm taking, uh, I'm, I'm taking about a month off and then I'm studying for captain. I go, but you, he goes, yeah. He goes, no, no, that's what we do. You get done and you you make the list. And he wasn't even promoted. Pro. He knew he was going to get promoted. He wasn't even a lieutenant yet. And he was already studying for the captain's list because he knew he was going to get promoted. The guys that have the crystal ball that go, I want to be there someday. The good ones don't just show up and go, here I am. The good ones bust their ass. They read stuff. They read books. They read articles. They teach. They mentor. They train. They get up early. They show up early. They're the go-to guys you can turn around and go, there they are. Terry, you look. 
nobody ever understands what goes on at chief's office. We talked about it before. If they only knew what goes on in the office, you know, the guys just kind of do their job and bubble around from ship to ship. But, and I have no problem. Louisville makes it easy to brag about because there's some great guys there. You know, what, what makes the great bosses, the great captains in Louisville, Terry? Well, I, I think you're describing it and that's be invested. Um, it, it's a, you know, I, that, that phrase about, um, are we hiring a, a firefighter or an employee? Um, and, and you've got employees at every rank chief and, and in every organization, um, in, in, in vet, you know, the other thing that, that I always like to remind people, which I think helps at every rank and every level, but broaden what your perspective is. Learn, you know, we talk about training and, and the natural gravitation is to go and read a leadership book or a tactics book or, or whatever. In our, in our city right now, there's an entire city that operates around you. You should understand that. You should understand what the water department does. And, and, and how different areas of the city, you know what, you should understand what your battalion chief's day is like and what a division chief's day is like, because that'll help you to understand the organization. It'll also help open your eyes to what lays ahead in your future. And, and so if you say, well, I want to take a promotional exam, I would challenge you to say, I wouldn't think just about the next position. The, I, I want to study to be a driver. I would instantly start thinking about that's your step because the other thing as a firefighter, we have a broad base of firefighters that, that are capable of going to driver. But when you go from firefighter to driver, hey, that, that pool of candidates just drastically reduced. And so that next step, you're not competing with 70 people, you're competing with 25, right? So I would think, I would think long-term, when you're, when you're thinking about promoting, obviously you're gonna invest your time into what, you need to accomplish in order to be successful in that moment. But you also don't need to lose sight of what is down the road. You know, Chief McNeil tells every group that we hire uh, when he addresses them the very first day, one of you, there's a, there's a chance that one of you will lead this organization one day. He didn't think about it when he walked in that door, but I guarantee you, as you start promoting up, you should be thinking about that stuff and you should take proactive steps to broaden your perspective about the organization, about your, your internal organization, the fire department, your organization, the city you work for, maybe the, the stuff we were talking about at the beginning of the show and legislation and, 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 and getting out there and getting involved in things that, you know, I mean, how many guys are coming to work right now thinking about what the impact of lithium ion ba batteries are going to be five years from now, right? So, you know, get, get outside your box and, 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 and open your eyes. Well, let's do this, you know, and, and, and I always worry because we have we get such a great conversation going there about running out of time. And Bobby, you're always good at Pete about that. Nah, we'll, we can go longer. But John, I know you've got to go um, visit with your new grandbaby and help Maureen out a little bit. Let, let's kind of run the circle here a little bit with advice. We're talking about the future of leadership in the fire service, what it's going to take to, you know, for someone to get there and what they need to prepare for it. John, you know, before, before you split in a few minutes on us, what advice would you give? You know, we've been talking about it all, you know, a bunch of stuff on the show. If you could sum it up, what advice do you give people about the future and where we should be going, you know, leadership wise? Well, I'm just going to reiterate one of the points I already made that was supported by some of the comments of some of the other guys is regardless of all the other things, who are you coming in and new people and new people being, you know, attracted to the fire service and what your process is. I, I think probably one of the biggest things that could have a positive impact on the future of leadership is for like, like Terry just said, you know, for the hierarchy, for, for the leaders of the fire department, the people up in the staff, the staff people, right, the chief, and, and then uh, for them to pay a little bit more attention and be involved in development of the future leaders rather than standing around and watching and seeing, holy shit, look who filed for the test, these 25 guys. Instead of saying that, there should be, some, to some degree, there should be an attraction, there should be a development. You know, and, and I did it as a company officer, I would tell guys, man, Listen, you, you're fine for seven or eight years now. You should be looking at the next lieutenant test. It's a couple of years away. You got it. I can see that you got it. And I didn't say that to everybody. Everybody in 48 Engine were great guys. And I didn't say it to everybody. Some of them were great firemen, and they should stay there and be great firemen until they retire. But some of them should be riding in the front seat. And I recognize that as a captain. So I think if the fire department administration builds not just comments, not just recruiting, not just being a, a you know, doing that, but to have it built into the process saying, you know what, if you've been, if you've been identified or if you feel like you want to promote 
like Terry said, you should know it ahead of time, right? When you're studying, when when you just said he was on a lieutenant's list studying for captain, you know he was really studying for battalion chief. You know that, right? He knew he was going to be a battalion chief. And the same thing, if fire departments start to put put the process together and put a system together, the guys have to start checking the boxes off and performing earlier in their career when they want to be your officers and getting stuff done. Requirements that the department's going to require you to do, that that produces a more, more long-term process where people can decide earlier and start working on it rather than worrying about getting promoted, getting a new shirt and saying, okay, now you got to make me a lieutenant. Now you got to train me, you know? So I, I think departments can do that. It's a matter of Re- realizing money and putting money into development and training, like Bobby said, rather than, you know, whatever else it is they might be doing. Yeah, if you want a good team, you know, say that old Build hashtag. your team, don't just watch it. That's right. right. Hashtag build a team, invest in your people. Scott, what do you think? John, that's a great message. Well, well, like you guys say, and I think it's hugely important, but the number one thing I always say when I get is you got to stay relevant. You got to understand all the aspects of this. And, you know, information is so available and it's changing so much that if, if you take a nap, you're behind, but but staying relevant in your skills and your knowledge and people and buildings and fire behavior and lithium batteries. And, and you do that by investing. You got to invest in yourself, but when you're a leader, you got to invest in, in other people. And, and that's really what a leader's role is, is to position people for success and survival, number one, and number two, prevent them from drifting towards failure. And we kind of talk about that on a regular basis. Always strive to make other people better. The higher you go, I think the, the more focus has to be on, on helping other people be better. And, and I think the best way to do that is, is through mentoring, either formal or, or traditional, having that one-on-one relationship where you sit down and say, hey, I'm going to invest in your future and, and I'm, going to, I'm, I'm going to help you do that. You, you got to be a problem solver. That, that's huge. Whether you're in the firehouse on the fire ground, you, you got to solve problems. And, and we're often too good at causing problems but you got to solve them. But I guess to sum it all up on my laundry list here, above all else, you got to be a positive influence. And we all have total control of that. Every day we make a decision. Are we going to be a positive influence or a negative one? And, and human nature sometimes is to, to be the griper and the complainer and the person on the sideline, you know, heckling. Uh, and, and so to me, that, that those are the things. And, and there's a lot of ways of doing that. And like, like both you and John said, we're dealing with people and every person is different. Therefore, leaders are different leadership styles and what motivates somebody, uh, you know, are, are all different. But the key to good leadership is learning your people and understanding that so that you can invest in them and, and position them. They got to put in the work. You know, you got to you got to meet halfway. It, it, it takes both people, but position them for success and survival in the firehouse and the fire ground and not allowing them to drift towards failure on those days when they're going to want it, when you got to reel them back in and say, Hey, you know, it's not just getting killed on the fire ground, but if you lose this job, your life is going to change tremendously. Okay. None of us are going to get another gig like this, or at least I'm not, I'm going to work at Amazon. If I lose this gig. <laughs> exactly. And I'll be surrounded by lithium batteries. <laughs> another great message. Thanks Scott. Um, a little long winded, but. There it is. <laughs> no, no, no. It's all good. It's all good. We're getting some great comments about Eric and the Lincoln Bureau Fire and all that. Chief Halton, Michael Corleone. Okay. Your 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 advice there, my godfather. <laughs> uh again, I'd like to apologize for my lack of a voice, but uh beyond my control. Um it, wonderful comments by everybody. Leadership is a journey, um, but the bottom line, I think we all agree on, is that you have just have to invest in the training of your people. You have to invest in being as clear as you possibly can about who we are, what we stand for, and 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 that's it. And and to John's point and to everyone's point, you know, the one of one of the places that and we had it in our home, we still have it, is the honor code from West Point. And it says, we won't lie, we won't steal, we won't cheat, we don't tolerate amongst us those who do. And it's just that simple. And the fire service should have just as easily a simple uh, honor code. And if we invest in our people, irrespective of maybe they're a little different than us, maybe you know there's different behavioral attitudes or different societal attitudes today, they're gonna solve the problems for their generation. And And, you know, we just have to keep investing. And I think that to Scott's point, you know, I always go back to drama's quote, 
if you don't know what your people are going through and you don't know what's expected of them, you don't know what you're doing. And you have to be an excellent firefighter or you're going to get somebody killed. And finally, you just have to be a good dude. And if I have to explain that one to you, I can't help you. And that's coming from, for our, for our, for our viewers, the commander, Bobby Sun uh, from the Navy, nicknamed Drama. So that's where I just went, you know, we call, all know. Call, call sign. Just, Nick, nicknames are different. Call sign. Yeah, call, call sign. Call sign. Call sign. Sorry. But again, it goes back to what we said, that our, our core values, our foundation, uh, nothing else matters without integrity, without honor, without pride, none of that stuff. Nothing else, it all falls apart without that. So um, I'm going to get to Terry here. John, I know you got to split. Give that baby a hug for us, okay? Yep, right. I'm ready to go. All right, Thank buddy, we'll more. see you next time. All right, pal. Terry, closing thoughts, pal? Well, I mean, I think all the points brought up today are, are excellent. I, You know, the only other thing I add is that you – there's John mentioned there's a hundred books on leadership, you know, find what works for you constantly reevaluate it. You know, the, the other thing is, is that I think if at the end of the day, regardless of, of whether you adopt a philosophy over here or philosophy over here, we're here to accomplish a mission, you know, that mission men and me, we're going to put the citizens first. We're going to treat people like family and I think if, if like for me, I'm, I'm just a person that I want to keep things really simple and I don't want a lot of really, uh, you know, far drifting, uh, you know, thoughts and ideas is just in the forefront, keep it really simple. And if we keep this community first, if we keep the, the overall, the, the reason we got into this profession is to help people and we keep that out front, then let those things be the things that are guiding you to where you need to be, whether you're the leader or whether you're the guy down here that's being led. Um, there was a, a, a quote on Twitter, I don't know it 100%, but it said, you know, good leader, bad leader, who cares? Be your best, you know, it, it's a, you go to work and do your best job. And and there are going to be people that are going to fail you. And and I'm, I'm probably the guy that has failed many. And, and I hope that I'm a guy out there that people have adopted or, or, or gravitated to, right? But I'm not going to be 100%. Nobody on here will be 100%. So, uh, you know, if you keep the, 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 the core values, the core ideas of what we're here and what, what we're trying to do, I think if you keep those out front, I think the rest of it with some work falls in line. I like that. You know what? If, if we're the best for those folks out there, then we're the best, period, you know? And know your buildings. Know your buildings, know your people. How about that? There you go. Know your buildings, know your people. All right. Well, hey, another 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 great show. Some to those that threw some comments at us, thank you so much. Uh, if you're looking to get a hold of Chief Halton, we always say this the best way: get on the website, open up that magazine. All his information is is, is on there for you. You can call him on his cell phone. You can get him on email, whatever. Uh, John is at, at Chief John Salk at gmail.com. Scott, best way to get a hold of you. Scott, fireserviceleadership.com. Perfect, perfect. Terry? T, uh, Terry, uh, it's Terry <laughs> McGrath, T. McGrath at cityoflouisville.com. And, 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 and the Functional Fire Company, you know, by the best-selling author, Chief Scott Thompson. There must be a lot of those movies. books laying around somewhere that they got to push. <laughs> this this is a fire sale. Push this book, Bobby. Push this book. We got too many of them. They're well, keeping I'm at them Chief in a lithium-ion battery factory. There you, there you go. And that's all coming too. Uh, I'm at Chief Lasky at gmail.com. Please uh, look look for the information that, that Bobby talked about at the beginning about the whole lithium battery uh, situation. It's out there. The information's there. Uh, some great stuff you can bring back to your department. Uh, if you have any questions, call the people that know. Uh, call the people that, that you know, are well-versed in that. When we did our COVID show a while back, you guys remember the one doctor says, stop going to, you know, if you have a heart problem, go to the heart specialist. If you have a lung problem, go to the lung specialist. You know what? Go to the people who invested their time and, and their knowledge and their background into this whole situation and get, get the information from them. So, hey, we're all on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and TikTok and all these different things and Instagram. Most of them, most of them we are. Bobby, you're on a bunch of them. Uh, our next show date is October 19th. Uh, there's always some great hump day hangouts on Wednesday with some great people here at noon central one Eastern. And don't forget, I always mention the podcast in the evening, the nightly podcast. There's some phenomenal folks out there having some great discussions 
about everything possible you could think about the fire service. Don't miss out on that. And I and I was I was teased a little bit earlier about Bobby being the Godfather with all his families that are underneath him. You look at you look at just go to the top menu bar, if you will, on fireengineering.com just to start with, and then click and look at all the different sites that are associated with Clarion and what 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 I'll probably say we do because I'm I've been with them forever and work for Bobby. Some great information. There's no reason to say I don't know. There is absolutely no reason to say I wasn't aware or I don't know. Not when you have it at your fingertips. So fireengineering.com, hit that as well as the other ones. In closing, we always ask you to please keep the men and women and armed forces in your thoughts and prayers. And remember, never forgetting means just that, never forgetting. Be safe. God bless you. Thanks again, guys.